I started last week talking about talking about this house, this spiritual house that that God wants to build in us. This this house of faith. It's it's the priorities that we need to have as a believer, as someone who has put their faith, their trust in Jesus. And last week we talked about the the foundation. We talked about the foundation and, and, and that foundation being Jesus Christ and, and our obedience to Him. And that's what God, that's the only foundation that God's going to build on. And I, I began sharing with you uh, when, a few years ago when we built our house out in Newcastle and how we, we chose Charlotte's cousin Luke. Actually, Charlotte did. She reminded me this week. I didn't know whether he was a good builder or not, but she did. And it was important who you choose to build your house. And and, and, and so he, he helped us, and we had this, we had this great foundation that was laid. And, but then the next step came, and I don't know about you, but I was helping Luke build the house, and I'm, I'm an amateur. I'm still an amateur. I can, you tell me which boards to nail, especially if you give me a nail gun, which is dangerous because I shot myself right there, but that's a whole other story. But, but uh, you know, I, I, can, I can do what you tell me to do, but Luke just knows what he's doing. And, but when you're building a house, I don't know about you, when you're building anything, you just want to see the finished product, right? You just want to get it done. But that's not how a good house is built. If you go out and you build it all and you throw the walls up and throw the roof and you haven't taken time to, to build the foundation, that thing's not going to stand. But there's another thing you have to do, and I was really impatient during this time. I was really impatient during this time that, that Luke was, was setting up the walls. Because what Luke did was he picked this corner of the house. Go ahead and throw that first one up. He picked this corner of the house. It was this, well, maybe. Yeah, that's, see... You, you guys just have to use your imagination. I'm, there it is. All right. Um, he, he picked this corner of the house right over here. And he drove a stake in the ground a few feet from the corner of that foundation. And he began to run lines and boards and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't know what you're doing, but I just want to build a house. But he began to line everything up with this corner. And, and so from that point on, we squared the entire house off of this corner right here and the lines that he drew. Or the lines that he pulled, the strings that he pulled, plumb line, if you will. And, and, and so it took all this time to get that. And, and as we're, I'm wanting to, you know, we're, we gotta, you got to attach it, by the way. This is going to be a good analogy, too. you got to attach the wall to the foundation. There's an integration that comes into play. And so, so we began to, to, to do all that. But then I'm thinking, okay, now what do we got to do? Well, he's got this line, and he takes the wall. And he makes that wall almost touch that line. And then he runs a whole bunch of stakes and a whole bunch of boards to hold that in place until we get to the next one. And we continue to square the house off of that. Now some of you say, does that really matter? Anybody ever tried to put tile down in your house? Some of you know. Anybody ever tried to put a pattern carpet down in your house? And it runs into a triangle at the end? You're like, what happened? You picked the wrong builder. <laughs> I'm not saying mine's perfectly square, but I'll tell you what, it's pretty close. Uh, last year, I won't bore you with the whole story, but my wife decided she wanted a pool. And so, in the off-season, she found a good deal. You know, you can complain if it's too expensive, but then when they find a good deal, you're like, okay, guess I have to say yes. And so, so then we decided we were going to build a deck. Now, you've got to understand, my pool's 33 feet in diameter. We can't get this small pool. We've got to get the 33-foot pool. And Charlotte comes to me, and I don't want her to make look bad. I don't want to make her look bad because I thought this, I kind of thought the same thing. But she goes, "You and Nick can throw a deck together." <laughs> yeah. Just go put just go put a little ten foot by ten foot deck. Well, we now have a forty eight by forty two foot deck because the more we went anyway, I won't bore you with that story either. But here's what I tell you. So we went on vacation. And Luke came again. We pick, Luke built my house. Luke built my deck. I mean, I, I'm going to pick the right guy to do it. And we come back, and all he's got set are the four corner posts. We're gone for a week. Now, granted, it rained a little bit while we were gone, but I expected him to have the deck done by the time I got back. There are 95 hole, post holes in our deck. And by the way, Nick and I dug all of those. Luke, Luke's the carpenter. He's not the the grunt work we are and so uh we dug all those but to watch him and he set the four corner posts and they're all men i mean he set those square 
and dug them and put them in the ground and put concrete in each one of them. And then he began to run those plumb lines again because he squared everything off of that. And, and, and he had batter boards and he had all this and he just put it all together because it's important when you start building a structure, the foundation's important. You got to make sure that it's going to, it's going to hold, it's not going to sink, that it's going to, it's not going to separate. And, but the next step you got to come to is you got to be, it's important how you build your walls, how you build your structure. And today, the analogy continues of this house that God's building. And I would like to suggest the structure, not just the walls of your house, but the roof and all of that, the entire framing, the entire structure is the Word of God. Now, do you see how that's integrated? The foundation is Jesus, and the Word of God is the structure. What's that mean for you and me? I want to tell you that if you're a true believer in Christ and you're beginning to put your faith in Him, this is important. You may think, oh, this is the Sermon on the Bible. Okay, all right. And you may check out. Don't check out. I've been doing ministry since 1986. I've been in semi-full-time and full-time ministry since 1986. And I have watched, and we keep saying how important the Word of God is, and yet I continue to see people who are, who are saying they're followers of Christ, who the Word of God is semi-important to them, if not important at all. And so as we build the foundation, our foundation around Jesus Christ and our faith in Him, we've got to, the next thing we've got to do is we've got to begin to build the walls, and we've got to square our lives with this book. We've got to square our lives as we build the walls with the Word of God. You know what happens if you don't square off that first corner of my house? I, it's crazy what happens by the time you get <laughs> farther down the road, right? Let me say it this way. You may have heard this before. But if you were going to travel into space, and you got all your calculations together, and you began to, to decide how, how, to, how to do all the calculations to figure out where you're going to hit, if you're off in your calculations right here by just a little bit, do you know how far you're going to miss the point you're trying to hit? Just say a long ways. A really, really long ways. Huh? Galaxies. If you miss it by just a little bit. And I'm telling you, as Christians, as followers of Christ, we got to make this book important. we got to stand on it. It's got to be built and squared. The psalmist says that this in one, chapter 119, which we're going to be there a lot today if you want to just turn to Psalm 119. But he says this, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. We live in a society today that is continuing to tell us, oh, well, I don't think that, you know, the parts that we, we pick and choose, and we, we all, it's like the Bible's become a scrapbook for us. We cut out the parts we don't like. We explain away the parts that we don't like. And we've forgotten that our entire faith is built on this. And there's going to be parts of this that I don't like, and there's going to be parts of this that make you uncomfortable. Not the sermon necessarily, but this book. But our life has to be squared, guarded against, according to His Word. There, so what are we going to do? You know, what comes next? We need to be guarding our, our, our lives according to this book. Uh, and we need to make the Bible very important in our life, but many people resist this. Many people resist it, and it doesn't become vital in life. Why do you think that is? I, I have just a few I'll throw at you. Number one, people say, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time to read the Bible. I'm going to try to say this as non-offensive as I can, because I'm just as guilty as, uh, of what I'm about to say. So please don't hear me pointing fingers. But we all were given the exact same amount of time every day, right? And every week. And we choose... We choose what to do with our time. And if we don't have time for the Bible, if we don't have time for the Word of God in our life, it's not because we don't have time, it's because we filled those slots with something else. Are, we, are, we, are you with me there? We have decided that these things are more important. And if we come to this place where we say, I don't have time, I need to make time. I need to take this book and say, this is important. This is important enough in me that the rest of my spiritual house will fall down if I don't make this important in my life. So that's one thing people resist. Maybe another, I can't or I don't understand the Bible. And I understand that. Can I tell you that I've been 
to four years of Bible college. I study this book every week sometimes to write sermons. I, have, I, I know a lot about this book, but I don't know everything. I read this book and sometimes I still go, God, what are you trying to say here? So you got to understand, you might not always understand everything. That's okay, keep digging, keep asking questions, keep trying to figure it out. Because it's important enough that you do that. And here's the, here's the, the kicker to that. I trust the Holy Spirit who lives in you. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and He will help you understand the parts you need to understand. Well, how about this one? People resist because they say, ah, it's just another book. Or, or I don't believe that it's true. Or I don't agree with it. I don't like what it says. Now, now there are some people who would say, wait a minute, aren't we talking to believers here? Aren't we talking about believers here? Yes, and I think there's a lot of believers who are still picking and choosing what they believe about this book. And what I'm trying to tell you is if you put your faith and trust in Him, this book is the truth. This book is, this book is, is exactly what God wants us to have. And we can stand on Oh, you can spend a lot of time trying to nitpick and find, well, I found an error in it. May, I don't know. I don't want to spend time today trying to de decide whether there's errors in it or not. What I want you to know is this is the truth of God's Word. And if we say we follow Jesus Christ, we've got to stand on the truth of this Word and the truth of this book. It's vitally important that we do that. It will never change. His truth will never change. No matter how. And, and by the way, some of you who think that our world's just, I mean, I can't believe where we're going. And it is horrible, where all the things I see in, in society today. But you know what? Go back and read history. You know? I'm telling you, there was some stuff happening back in history. Just go read about Nero. You don't have to go any farther than that. You will find some of the exact same things we're dealing with today. God is still on His throne. He has not lost control. And just because, you know, everything seems like it's falling apart. Isaiah and 1 Peter tells us that His Word, grass withers and flowers fade, but His Word will remain true. It will stand forever. And we can put our faith in that. Hebrews writer says it this way, God's word is alive and working and sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us where the soul and the spirit are joined to the center of our joints and our bones and it judges the thoughts and feelings in our heart. That's a powerful book, isn't it? Nothing in all the world can be hidden from God. Everything is clear and lies open before him and to him we must explain the way we have lived. It's powerful. So how do we build structure? What are you going to do? What do you think about the Bible? I, I know that for a lot of you, there's a lot of things going through your head right now. Some of you, and it's okay. I'm not offended. Some of you are questioning what I'm saying even. You don't, you don't necessarily want to go this far with me on the Bible. That's fine. Just open your mind long enough for us to have this discussion. For us, well, it's really not a discussion. For you to hear a monologue. <laughs> but... but you're more than welcome to come and talk to me and we can talk about it. But this, this book is vital. So what do you think about the Bible? What do you think about this book? What does it mean to you? What role does it play in your life as a follower of Christ? What priority does it have? We just sang a song a while ago. Many people pour their gold and serve a thing that shines. We have so many idols in this world and then we say we don't have time for this. It's time that we say I'm going to make time for this. So what do you need to do? I'm going to give you these fast. I'm about to read a lot of scripture. You may not stay up with me, okay? But I don't want to just get bogged down, and I hope you can stay with it. But what do we need to do? First of all, you need to study and learn the book. You need to do everything you can to study this and to learn it. Here comes some scriptures. You ready? Most of them from Psalm 119, verses 7 and 8. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn... Your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Verses 18 says, Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. I will pursue your commands, for you expand my understanding. Teach me your decrees, O Lord. I will keep them to the end. Then you skip to verses 62, 66, and 73. It says this, In the middle of the night, oh no, now you're getting, that's when I sleep. 
In the middle of the night, I get up to thank you because your laws are right. God ever wake you up in the middle of the night? And I used to think something was wrong. I used to think, God, why can't I sleep? I just want you to know that what I do now, and this is a little bit about next week, but what I do now is when I get woke up in the middle of the night, whatever, whoever God brings to my mind, I begin to pray. Because I don't think it's an accident that he woke me up. And sometimes I just start reading my Bible. My wife doesn't like it because my Bible is on here. And so it lights up the room. So sometimes I have to go in the other room. But it's not an accident. So in the middle of the night, I get up to thank you because your laws are right. Teach me wisdom and knowledge because I trust your commands. You made me and formed me with your hands. Give me understanding so I can learn your commands. Verse 97 says, Oh, how I love all you've revealed. I reverently ponder it all day long. 2 Timothy says this, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Scripture is important and it does a lot of powerful things. Romans chapter 15 says it this way, Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. The Scriptures give us patience and encouragement so that we can have hope. And then 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive His approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. We need to study the Bible. We need to learn the Bible. We need to, to get it into our hearts and learn it and study it and do everything we can. How do you study it? Let me just give you a couple of, of pointers on this. First of all, you need to read the Bible all the way through. At some point in your life, at least once, and hopefully more than once, you need to sit down and you need to read every bit of the Bible. But here's the problem with that. Depending on how long that takes you, sometimes it can just be, you know, I don't remember anything. But that's okay. You're just pouring it into your life. I was talking with someone this week and I was telling them, you know what? We don't know what battles we're going to face in the future. But if we'll let the Word of God be in us, and we'll study it and get to know it. We don't know what, what tools in that chest that we're putting in is going to be useful to us in the midst of that battle, in the midst of that trial, in the midst of what we're going through. So just study it, and all of a sudden, God will bring to mind this verse that you read, and you're like, wow, where'd that come from? And you just, So read it all, but then I want to give you something else. I, a few months ago, I decided to read the Bible in six months, not for the faint of heart. It's really, really tough. It's a lot of reading. It's about an hour a day, and it was... It was tough, and I had to get up early, and I lost some sleep, and it was not, but it was good. I enjoyed it. But now you know what I'm doing? I slowed to a, a snail's pace. I'm reading one chapter a week, the same chapter, a day, every day for a week. Right now, I'm, this week, I'm in Romans chapter 4. And I've read it in four different versions now, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I've got three more days to go that I will read Romans chapter 4. I'm also on top of that reading the life of Jesus. Just a little, uh, uh, there, there's some great things. There's an app on here called YouVersion, uh, a church here, Life Church here in town. Put that together. It's there. It's free. It's got reading plans. It's got the Bible. It's got all the versions of the Bible. Go get it. It's free if you have a, a smartphone and use it because... But I'm, I'm slowing down and I'm asking questions. And I'm rereading and I'm rereading and I'm rereading the same thing. Because I'm seeing, every day I'm seeing something different. Or I'm driving home the point that God's trying to teach me. I've got back there in the back, there's not very many of them, there's about 40 of them. So grab one or before everybody else gets them. But John Piper has a little article, How to Read the Bible for Yourself. And it's really, really good. It's back on the sound booth, so on your way out, grab one of those. Because it's important that we study and learn it, but it's also important, as it's already up here, that we memorize it. We need to memorize the Bible. We need to know the Bible. Uh, I, listen to these scriptures. You know this one probably. Verse 11 of Psalm 119. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your greatest weapon against the enemy's attacks is this book. You need to memorize it. Colossians 3 says it this way. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. The word of God needs to be in you. Memorized it. We have a preschool here at this church. And it's incredible. We have an academy as well. And they do the exact same thing I'm about to share with you. But the preschool's in this building, so I see them all the time. Some of you have kids in the preschool. 
And your kids have come home. Jaylee Bird, uh, Chelsea's daughter, came into me the other day, and she said, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. She's four. And she knows the fruit of the Spirit. I was sitting in here one day, and the preschool was getting ready for their program. But some of the four-year-olds were sitting in here. And Miss Jill, the music teacher, she said, okay, and she's taught them the Ten Commandments. Not the way we, you know, not word for word out of the Bible. She has these little phrases, and they all know the Ten Commandments. She goes, all right, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to ask you. Someone tell me, without looking in your Bible, the Sixth Commandment. Right? We know what they are. Yeah, you, you're going to get it, Phil? You might know. There, I, hopefully somebody does. These kids spit it out, four years old. You think that they're ready for some battles that are coming their way? Because they've hidden God's word in their heart so that they won't sin against you. If a four-year-old can do it, I think you and I can do it, can't we? I remember going to church camp when I was a little kid. And we had, it was competition, I know. Whoever won got extra canteen or, you know, extra snacks at, during the day or something. But we memorized scripture. And, you know, I, if you're a good church camp person... You knew that you got the same points for John eleven thirty five that you did for any other verse. Anybody know what that says? Jesus wept. Yeah. Give me my candy bar. I memorized the Bible, right? That's how we all know John three sixteen, isn't it? Somebody drove it in our head. Memorize it. What else does he say though? Not only memorize it, but long for it. Oh, crave it. You need to long for this book. Listen to what he says, Psalm 119, 36. Give me an eagerness for your laws rather than a love for money. When's the last time you woke up and said, God, I want to know your laws. I'm so eager to find out what you want to teach me. How many of you, don't raise your hand because I'll be depressed. How many of you this morning go, I can't wait to get to church to hear what Nathan's preaching about. We need to have this craving, this longing for it. It's verses 81 and 82. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? If I told you right now that I had tickets to the Thunder game tomorrow night, and I was going to give them to the first person who could run up here on the stage, somebody's getting hurt, Right? If I told you they were courtside, that's good, Mike. If it was LSU, I bet baseball you might, right? Yeah, there you go, see. I'll get, I'll get all of you somewhere. But uh, No, if I had courtside seats, somebody would really get hurt. We long for that. That'd be awesome. I, that maybe, whatever, you, you insert whatever it is for you. Do we have that kind of longing for the Word of God? I've got to be careful with what I say because I don't want anybody to be offended by this. But if you go on social media, all you're going to hear about is some man that made music that died and what a tragedy it is. Oh, if we longed for the word of God like we long for the, to be noticed by people of fame. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? Listen to this. I love this one. Verses 30, 130 and 131. Learning your words gives wisdom and understanding for the foolish. Here it is. Listen. I am nearly out of breath. I really want to learn your commands. Other versions say, I'm panting. Anybody got a dog? I mean, you walk in with like, like food in your hand, right? And they just start slobbering. Their tongue comes out. <laughs> right? When's the last time that described how we looked at the Word of God? I can't wait to get in the Word. Peter says it this way, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. Crave it, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. I told you that God wakes me up sometimes. And I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, because you know what? It has not been my life. I've been your minister. I'm in my 20th year as, as a pastor here at this church. And it's been in the last 12 months that God has really made me long for His Word like I do right today. And I hope next year I can say I long for it more. I hope it wasn't that I wasn't longing for it. I hope I'm just longing for it more today. But I wake up, God wakes me up, and can I tell you one of the first thoughts after Charlotte's going to get mad if I turn this light on. One of the first thoughts that comes to my mind 
is I wonder if I should just go ahead and get completely awake so I can go ahead and read the word. That's a longing. God, what are you going to teach me today? And, and what's great is I don't have this checklist. The problem sometimes with reading the whole Bible through is it almost becomes a checklist. Okay, I did it today. And it's like, oh my goodness, I got seven chapters today. You know, I'm reading such small nuggets. It's exciting. God, what are you going to teach me? I'm reading tomorrow. I'm reading what I read today. What are you going to teach me new today? There's a longing and a panting for it. And we need to have that kind of craving for the Word of God. So you study it and you learn it. You memorize it. You crave it. You long for it. Now here comes the tough one. You need to live by it. See, I think this is where as believers we've kind of taken a detour. One of our elders a few months ago said it this way, and I, I, I've quoted him many, many times, but Kyle said this in our meeting one time. What's so disheartening is I see so many people who say they follow Christ, and they say, I see what the Bible says, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going, I understand what the Bible says, but I'm going to live differently from that because I don't want to do that, or because I don't agree with that, or whatever it is. But if we're going to square our lives, the house that God is building, with the Word of God, we've got to live by it. A friend of mine who's a pastor in Broken Arrow, Greg Pittman, he says this about reading Scripture. He asks this question of Scripture. How am I going to obey this? When's the last time you asked that? How am I going to obey this? Who am I going to share it with? Here's what Psalm says about living by it. Happy are those who live pure lives, who follow the Lord's teachings. Verse 56, 57, and 63 says, This is how I spend my life, obeying your commandments. Lord, you are mine. I promise to obey your words. I am a friend to anyone who fears you, anyone who obeys your commandments. And then verse 105, 106, it says, Your word, Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Meditate, or he says, I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. And then Joshua, Joshua says this, study the book of instruction continually and meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Listen, what I'm telling you will ruin your life. It'll make you happier. But it will ruin the life you now live. Let me see if I can get you to understand that. Anybody ever been doing something, watching a show, acting a certain way while you're driving? <laughs> um, you've been doing something and all of a sudden, something from the Word of God comes in your mind. You're like, oh man. There was a few months ago, that's been actually about a couple of years ago. We were on vacation. And I went on vacation to relax. And, and I was reading a book, sitting on the deck of a boat. And I was reading a novel. That's pretty safe, right? I don't read, and I read my Bible, but I don't read instructional material, ministry instructional material on vacation, because that just gets me thinking about work, and I'm wanting to relax. So I'm reading a novel. It's a Christian novel, but I'm reading a novel. I actually read four novels that week because I'm just relaxing and reading. Well, all of a sudden, I, I, I understand the theme of this book I'm reading is about forgiveness. And I've got someone in my life. I had someone in my life at that time that I was not forgiving. I didn't forgive them. I didn't want to forgive them. I chose I, on purpose not to forgive them. And I, I remember sitting on that deck, I don't know, uh, Charlotte's mom was with us, so she was out taking care of her mom as the last trip we went with her. And I'm reading on this deck of this boat, and I'm reading, and I'm like, and I seriously, in my mind, I don't know if I said that loud, if I did, I had, had, had my headphones in, and someone probably thought I was weird, but I said, really, God? I'm on vacation. Can I just relax? And he's like, no. You ever had that happen to you? If you say, I'm going to live by this book, if you make a declaration, you close the book and you say, God, I don't care what it says, I don't care, I don't care what instruction it is, whatever is in this book, I'm going to do it. Anybody think that will radically change your life? Yeah, yeah, it's like, man, 
I wanted to yell at the person that cut me off. I wanted to continue watching this TV show. I wanted to keep saying these words. And God goes, look here. It's great that we study and learn it. And it's great that we memorize it. And it is awesome. It is awesome that we, that we are longing for it, that we're craving it. But if we don't live by it, none of that means anything. Let me say it, let me say it a little stronger. If you say you follow Jesus, You must love, long for, study, and obey the Bible. And if this is not what you're squaring your life by, you need to fall on your knees and ask God, am I really your follower? Because all dogs don't go to heaven. Some of you are going to hate me because you're pet lovers. I'm not talking about pets. Saying that I follow Christ doesn't guarantee me a place in, on the, behind the pearly gates. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't turn this into legalism. Because I'm going to be behind the pearly gates because of what Jesus did on the cross and my faith in Him, right? But when that's real in my life, I start obeying what this says. It's a natural byproduct of my faith that I put in him. You see, we nailed the wall to the foundation of Jesus Christ. It is integrated. Let me close by asking it differently, okay? Because I think maybe this is our obstacle. Maybe this is why we struggle so much with this. So let me ask you a question. What if you didn't have this? But what if it was illegal? What if it wasn't readily available? Everyone in this, well not everyone because some of you are young, <laughs> your parents or you can drive to Mardell. Are they open today? No. Okay, tomorrow. You can drive tomorrow to Mardell and you can pick up any copy. Any, I just told you, you've got an app. You can pull this up and you can get the Bible. Any, right now, I think our Wi-Fi is fast enough now. You could have the Bible in your hand in about 30 seconds to two minutes. You could have the Bible at your... What if that wasn't available? What if we didn't have this? Would it change the way we look at it? Because I think sometimes it's just there. I've got, I can't tell you, I don't even know how many Bibles are in my office. You look underneath the chairs, we've got over 100 Bibles in this room. It's just there, and so we just, we just, uh, it's there, I'll read it when I get time. What if you didn't have access to it? Because there are people all over the world right now who do not have access to that, that book. And they don't have access to clean water. They don't have access to food. And we should be meeting that need. But we also should be meeting this need. But what if you didn't have it? Let me ask it this way. If you immediately, let's say tomorrow, all the Bibles in America were taken away. This isn't trying to scare you. Let's just go with me. Let's just say they were. How much of it is in your heart and in your mind that you could live out your spiritual faith. Does that make you want to learn more? I don't know if it's ever going to be taken away from us. It might. But while I've got it, I want to do everything I can to learn it, to study it, to memorize it. So what if you didn't have it? There's a tribe in Africa, I think they're called the Gamu tribe. And Brenton Brown wrote a song called Word of God. I'm going to play that song for you, but before that song, he's going to share with you. And you're going to see images of some kids who got the Bible in their hands for the first time. And I want you to look at that, and I want you to ask this question. Do I love the Word of God that much that that's what my face looks like every time I open it up? In June of 2012, the Gamma people got the Bible translated in their own language for the first time. We almost take for granted that um, we experience when God speaks through his scriptures that the creator of the heavens and the earth, uh, the almighty God, the supreme being, 
is talking to us through these scriptures. It's quite hard not to be stirred by it because you get to see on the faces of the Gamma people experiencing this for the first time, not just the acknowledgement of the truth of the scriptures, that ring of authority, the ring of heaven that God's truth has, but then uh, the, also the hope that this Lord of the heavens and the earth, the maker of the universe, the one who made us and made our families, made all that we see around us is actually speaking to us right now. And that he's taken special care to address us through these scriptures, that he's taken special care to put together this extraordinary book we call the Bible and to not just um, communicate truth to us, but to communicate it um, every time we read it. Uh, it's living, it's powerful, it's able to change us, and uh, He's able to change us. And it's efforts like this by the Sea Company that make me just applaud them and cheer them on. Go Sea Company, go Bible Translators. We know what you're doing is not easy. We know what you're doing it can be difficult at times, it's time consuming, but go for it, don't stop.